Hi everybody, uh, welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. Uh, sorry about the sound problems there, but we've got it all going now. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 100,000 competing professionals and students who are ACM's members. I'm Nicholas Matei, I'm a research staff member here in the Cognitive Computing Group at IBM, uh-oh, apparently nobody can hear me. at IBM TJ Watson <laughs> Research Lab. I also serve as the ethics officer for ACM SIG AI, uh, the ACM special interest group uh, on artificial intelligence. Uh, I've been co-organizing the ACM SIG AI student essay contest on the responsible use of AI technologies. Uh, we'll, have a we'll have a slide up in a little bit uh, for you guys if you wanna uh, participate in that. My co-moderator today is Rosemary Paredes, principal research engineer for Lead us Health and Life Sciences, and Secretary Treasurer for the ACM Special Interest Group on Artificial Intelligence. Uh, Rosemary's current work as a data scientist for big data analytics includes building models in computational linguistics and natural language processing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. You can find more info on our backgrounds in the bio widget on your screen. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a wide range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in global environments. ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM, including communications of the ACM and Q magazines, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics. There's also support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prizes in Computing Awards. And finally, they, the ACM promotes ethical conduct among computing professionals by publicizing the Code of Ethics and other initiatives of the Committee on Professional Ethics. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enrich our lives and advances society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. If at any time we are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press the F5 key in Windows or Command-R if you're on a Mac, or manually refresh your browser uh, on your laptop or mobile device. Or you can close and relaunch the whole presentation, because that always works. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of additional widgets and resources. You'll find resources materials also in the right sidebar. To control the volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. Since this presentation is based on questions from you, please type your questions into the Q&A box accessible through the widget at the bottom of your screen at any time during the webinar and press the submit button. Rose is working hard in the background to organize the questions and we'll ask them aloud to the panel uh, when we get to them. The session is being recorded and will be archived. You'll receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available and check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey uh, open up on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out and help us to improve our webinars. You may also open the survey at any time throughout the presentation from the resources window on the right sidebar. You can also use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag hash ACM learning. We'll be watching for your tweets. Today's presentation is Panel and Town Hall, Big Thoughts and Big Questions about Ethics and Artificial Intelligence. Before we get into the introducing our speakers, I want to have a quick advertisement for another initiative from ACM uh, SIG AI. If, after our, today's presentation, you feel that you want to weigh in on the conversation, if there's something that we aren't talking about that you feel needs more attention, or you just want the opportunity to win one-on-one -on -one chats with top AI researchers or cash prizes, then ACM SIG AI has the program for you. The ACM SIG AI Student Essay Contest on the Responsible Youth Use of Artificial Intelligence Technologies is an open call to all students to submit an essay of up to 5,000 words discussing what you see as the one to two most pressing ethical, social, or regulatory issues related to AI technologies and suggest what positions or steps governments, industries, or organizations like SIG AI could take to address these issues. Winning essays uh, will be published in the SIG AI's new newsletter, AI Matters, 
For more information, please see the SIG AI blog. The link is up on your screen at sigai.acm.org slash AI matters slash blog. So we hope uh, people from today will take the opportunity to participate uh, in that essay contest. So now we'll move on and I'll introduce the panel that makes up the panel for today's webinar. We're fortunate today to have four distinguished panelists uh, with us. The first is Joanna Bryson, who is an associate professor at the University of Bath and an affiliate of Princeton Center for Information and Technology Policy. She's a transdisciplinary researcher on the structure and dynamics of human and animal-like intelligence, covering topics ranging from artificial intelligence through autonomy and robot ethics and onto human cooperation. Joanna is running the Society with AI conference this April at the University of Bath. Next is Francesca Rossi, who is a research scientist also here at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center and a professor of computer science at the University of Padova, Italy, where her research interests focus on constraint reasoning, preferences, multi-agent systems, computational social choice, and collective decision making. She is a fellow of the AAAI and URAI, co-chairs the AAAI Committee on AI and Ethics, and is a member of many editorial and advisory boards, including the World Ep Economic Forum Council on AI and Robotics. Francesca has given several media interviews about the future of AI and AI ethics and delivered three TEDx talks on these topics. Third panelist is Stuart Russell, who is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science and the holder of the Smith Zada Chair in Engineering at UC Berkeley. He's also an adjunct professor of, professor of neurological surgery at UC San Francisco and vice chair of the World Economic Forum's Council on AI and Robotics. Stuart's research covers a wide range of topics, including machine learning, probabilistic reasoning, knowledge representation, planning, real-time decision-making, multi-target tracking, computer vision, computational psychology, global seismic monitoring, and philosophical foundations. He's a fellow of the ACM, AAAI, AAAS, and AAAS. Stewart has published several books, including the popular textbook, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach, co-authored with Peter Norvig. Finally today, we have Michael Woolridge, who is the head of the department and professor of computer science in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Oxford. He's also a senior research fellow at Hertford College. His main research interests are in the use of formal techniques of one kind or another for reasoning about multi-agent systems. Michael is a fellow of the ACM, the AAAI, URAI, AISB, and BCS. He's also a member of the academic Europea. He's a recipient of the ACM Autonomous Agents Research Award and the president of the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence. You can find more info on all the panelists in the bio widget on your screen. There's also a slide. <laughs> so now we're gonna to start today's webinar. We're gonna let the members of our panel tell you a bit about what initiatives they're heading up at the moment, or also it's sort of open, uh, what, they, what they think is the most important uh, thing sort of happening in the AI and ethics space right now. So we're going to go in uh, round robin alphabetical order, which means that we'll start uh, with Joanna. So take it away. Hi, uh, thanks. You've already introduced me incredibly well, but let me just say very quickly to follow up what you said. Um, the, the meeting is the uh, annual meeting of AISB. Please Google that if you want to. You can put in an abstract. Uh, almost all of the symposia at the AISB have been extended to the end of this month. So please do come talk to about, it, uh, uh, about society with AI and some other topics with us. It's the annual meeting of a, of a large uh, AI meeting. Um, what I do, I actually uh, started studying artificial intelligence because I was interested in natural intelligence. So my first degree is actually psychology, but I did a PhD in AI, uh, at, well, a master's at Edinburgh and then a PhD at MIT. Um, and, but my, my main interest, my, my most fundamental interest was understanding why, why different people use cognition to different extents, why different species use cognition to different extents. And the consequence uh, where that led me, it turns out that um, giving information away, which is something that we see happening in species that, that do use cognition as a strategy, is a form of public goods. So I actually spend a lot of my time now studying human cooperation. Um, which is really fortunate because one of the things I started doing during my PhD was studying AI ethics, not because I thought, oh, that'd be cool. It was because people came up and said bizarre things to me. Like I was working on a, well, basically a pile of motors that was soldered together in the shape of a human. And people came up and said, uh, that would be unethical to unplug. And I was like, well, it's not plugged in and it doesn't work. 
And so I realized people really didn't know what they were talking about with, well, AI ethics, and I've now realized it's more general, that we're, we're very confused about what we owe obligations towards. However, I would say right now that um, this thing about whether or not we owe obligations to robots is not very taking as much of my time as it used to because so many other things are taking my time. So my most exciting research, I guess, um, we're doing some work showing that uh, that that uh, all kinds of human concepts from uh, really visceral qualia like our distaste for insects to uh, human prejudice, uh, sexism, racism can be picked up just automatically by reading human text. So so uh, basic machine learning algorithms uh, give you that. That's that's work that's currently not published yet. So I can't really talk about it at length. Um, I'm also working on understanding the public goods investment is, has brought me to working with people and also concerns about AI ethics and, and unemployment has brought me to working on studying the correlation between uh, income inequality and political polarization, which is something we've seen not only now, but also at the early part of the 20th century. So it's not just AI, but does seem to be linked to new technologies in general. Um, with my PhD students, the, the, we're working on trying to make AI more transparent. So my PhD was actually about making it easier to build real-time AI systems like uh, robotics and game AI. And we figured out that the same things that help people design this also help people develop better um, intuitions about how much ethics is owed or what the, 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 um, the status, the, 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 status, the uh, social status of AI is. If we can see how it works, then we're less confused by how animal-like it appears. Um, but the thing that's taking all my time these days right now is actually that the European Parliament is working on trying to come up with a system of regulations for AI. They've already done their ahead of the world on, uh, on data but beyond that, on questions like automation um, and who's responsible for uh, the use of automation instead of humans and, and, and how that should be handled in terms of legal and tax liability. So that's what I'm doing these days. Hi, everybody. I'm Francesca Rossi. So I'm very happy to be here in this panel and to discuss about AI ethics with all of you. So, uh, yeah, so I'm very interested in understanding, you know, the impact of AI uh, and what it means for AI to be pervasive, so pervasive in our everyday life, both uh, personal life and professional life. And I think that there are many ethical implications because AI is so much used and it will be used even more in the future and it will be, it have a huge impact on everything we do. So there are a lot of ethical implications in that and things to be discussed, issues to be raised, the concerns possibly to be addressed in the right way. But I'm also interested in uh, um, understanding how to make this AI system that we develop and we deploy to the real world, uh, in, to make them in a way that they behave ethically, whatever it means to behave ethically in the particular scenario in which we are going to deploy them. So to give you an example, if I, uh, I'm going to build a decision support system for a doctor for, uh, uh, to, in order to help that doctor to make the best uh, diagnosis or to choose the best therapy for a patient, I would like that decision support system to support that doctor, but also in, in the best way, but also to be able to follow the same ethical principles that I expect a human doctor to follow. So. Um, Another example is a companion robot for an elderly person. I would like that uh, robot to be able to understand what are the ethical you know, behavior that I expect from somebody taking care uh, of an elderly person and to behave accordingly. So these are this second thing is the one that, that we think that the topic that I work mostly also from the technical and scientific point of view, because this is not just uh, a discussion among uh, people that try to address some issues and resolve it, but also it can be solved in a very uh, concrete, uh, solid, uh, scientific work. Um, and in particular, what I'm trying to do in, with my research is trying to understand how to model and how to embed ethical principles into AI systems. And uh, in, in particular, into those AI systems that are intended to help humans make better decisions. So they're not intended to be 
completely autonomous, but are intended to work together with humans in order to make better decisions. And it has been seen by several studies that in uh, in many cases, the working together between humans and machines is actually achieving a better performance in terms of effectiveness of the task that you want to uh, accomplish, rather than the machine alone and the human alone. So this is, I think, you know, it's a very interesting area of collaborative system between the AI and the uh, humans. Of course, in many domains, there are also other issues that have ethical implications, like, for example, those related to data uh, biases, like the medical domain is a typical one, uh, you know, who owns the data of the patients, who, uh, um, you know, um, handles this data, what is done with this data. So a lot of has to be done in terms of transparency and trust between the entity, you know, handling this data and, and the people owning the data. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, then, uh, and so, but uh, in my view, uh, it's really, you know, there are still a lot of challenges, interesting technical and scientific challenges in uh, addressing these ethical concerns, you know, uh, around the data issues, of course, to understand how to be aware of the biases of the data and possibly mitigate them. And in the in building decision support system that behave ethically, uh, there is, of course, the issue of value alignment. You know, we want these systems to be working with values that are aligned to those of humans. And this value alignment uh, uh, issue is uh, very important. It's not something that concerns only uh, general AI, uh, but also very specific AI that can be deployed right now. You know, so it's something very short term that should be solved as soon as possible, uh, because otherwise we would deploy systems that are not maybe behaving in the way we desire. Uh, there are also other challenges, of course, that I see that uh, they need to be addressed and solved, like uh, I don't know, unsupervised learning or common sense reasoning, given the capabilities for the system to uh, know how the world function and to have the, this kind of common sense reasoning that we humans rely upon very much. Um, and, uh, um, and in general, I think that especially in this area of human-machine uh, collaborative systems, I think it's very important to be able to understand how to build the correct level of trust between the human and the machine. We don't want the humans to under trust the system, you know, because uh, otherwise it would not be able to get all the, to exploit all the capabilities of the system, but also we don't want the human to over trust the system, uh, which uh, um, would mean that uh, the human, you know, thinks that there are capabilities that maybe the system does not have. So in order to achieve that, I do research, but I also participate in many other initiatives to address the concerns and discuss them and solve them in the best way. One of them that is taking a lot of my time is the partnership on AI. That's a, uh, that's a, uh, an initiative uh, that has been put together by five big companies who are uh, you know, currently deploying uh, AI into the real world, which is IBM, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Microsoft. And, uh, um, and, and the, the goal of this initiative, although it has been put together by companies, is to actually engage with all the possible stakeholders in this, impacted by these uh, ethical issues of AI and to discuss them uh, in the most concrete way to do, you know, significant step forward into the resolution of these issues. Uh, so if you want to know about more about it or want to join this effort or participate in any way, just go to the website to www.partnershiponai.org and you'll see what, what it is. Then there are also other initiatives, like, for example, IEEE, which is a very large um, association of engineers all over the world has put together a kind of a, a code of conduct for engineers and for all of those that build uh, AI systems uh, and is in a draft version and you can read about it and it's uh, it's uh, called uh, ethic, you know, it's it's related to this initiative that I, um, IEEE has on uh, ethical consideration on uh, artificial intelligence and autonomous systems and again you know is in a state where everybody can give feedback and uh, and uh, improve uh, you know these recommendations that we may want to give to people building AI system 
Uh, and then another thing that I participate is uh, um, uh, this, uh, the Future of Life Institute. I'm an advisory board of that institute. And this is a very instrumental institute together with many, many others that have been built in the last uh, you know, few years to um, put together you know, um, people from many different disciplines and address, addressing these issues of AI ethics. And uh, this is very important because the issues cannot be addressed by AI people alone, but uh, you need a very multidisciplinary discussion with people from uh, ethics of psychology, philosophers, uh, lawyers, uh, economists, uh, and so on. So that's also, I think, a very important uh, uh, um, set of initiatives that this institute and many others are putting together. And I think it's very promising in terms of you know, going forward in the discussion. Okay. Hey, um, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, so my my first reaction to the word ethics in AI is, um, yep, that's definitely a good idea. Ethics is always good. My second reaction, which is probably shared by many people, is uh, I don't want to be nagged by do-gooders telling me what to do, what not to do. Um, you know, I'm an ethical person. Of course, my research uh, in system building and so on is going to be ethical. Uh, so in its simplest terms, ethics is about avoiding negative consequences. Um, and in most cases in AI, that doesn't really present an ethical dilemma. Uh, it's really about sy building systems that, that work. And up to now in AI, uh, there haven't really been the possibility for much in the way of negative consequences. You know, you can, you can play chess well or badly or Go or poker. Um, you can be you know, not very good at machine translation. None of that really has negative ethical consequences. But once we start uh, driving cars or you know, rejecting people for employment or putting people in prison using AI systems, then of course there can be serious negative consequences. And you know, just as in civil engineering, um, you know, we don't talk about the you know, ethical issue of whether bridges should fall down or not. Uh, it's kind of obvious common sense that bridges shouldn't fall down and that nuclear power stations shouldn't explode. These are not what we call ethical issues or dilemmas. Um, and in the near term, as, as Francesca mentioned, there are clearly going to be some, some areas where uh, there are these negative consequences. So uh, the safety of self-driving cars, the, uh, the use of um, lethal autonomous weapons to kill large numbers of people, uh, the use of AI for automated surveillance, uh, and persuasion, political persuasion, blackmail, and so on of individuals. Um, then there are questions about uh, bias in machine learning systems that Joanna mentioned. Uh, these are all, uh, as it were, local problems. You can, you'll be able to see their effects locally, um, and you have to figure out ways to fix them, whether it's legislation or treaties or just the economic consequences of building systems that, that don't work very well uh, and people stop buying them. Um, but I'm actually interested in uh, a longer term issue, which actually Alan Turing uh, talked about on several occasions. The most famous quote uh, from him is that um, at some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. So he was talking about what happens as, uh, as machine learning proceeds uh, and machines become more intelligent than people. Um, so he didn't really say how that would happen or, or what, what would go wrong uh, that would result in this uh, conflict, so to speak. And um, now Norbert Wiener, who is the founder of modern control theory, automation, um, wrote a paper in 1960 uh, where he clarified exactly what the point is, which is the point that uh, Francesca mentioned about um, the need for the objectives that machines have to be aligned with those of humans so that we don't accidentally set up a conflict between a machine that has an objective that we've put in that turns out not to be the one that we really want. So he said, we better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Um, and if we don't solve this problem uh, and we create super intelligent machines, which is what everyone is, is pushing towards and spending 
billions and millions of dollars and, and many of the smartest people in the world are going into the field right now uh, with this in mind. Uh, if we don't solve the problem, um, then that raises, I think, what may be a real ethical dilemma is, is, is it ethical to pursue AI beyond a certain level if that creates a risk uh, of this sort of irreversible conflict or sort of problematic relationship between uh, human beings and the machines that we have built. Um, so some people in the field um, actually think that this isn't an issue at all, uh, and, and I've cataloged at least 15 uh, mostly embarrassingly uh, refutable arguments as to why we should pay no attention to this. Um, but in fact, I think it's, it is a real problem, and it's, it's a real problem because the way we've conceived of AI is that uh, we build machines that are very good at achieving objectives, um, whether they anything from you know, planning to game playing uh, to uh, things that solve Markov decision processes and so on. They all assume that the human is going to provide the objective, uh, and then the machine is going to optimize it and either supply us with a solution or carry out the solution if it has the, the physical capability. Um, and that uh, that framework leads directly to this problem that once you put the objective in, um, then the machine, if it's sufficiently capable, will, uh, will pursue it to the exclusion of everything else because, by definition, whatever objective you've given it does exclude everything else but that objective. Um, and then you have a problem, right? You have a problem, you know, that uh, a machine would defend itself, uh, would not allow itself to be switched off because, you know, you it knows that it can't fetch the coffee if it's dead. Um, so, um, so it's going to defend itself against anyone who might even possibly present a risk of switching off the machine uh, while it's on its way to get the coffee. So this kind of pathological behavior seems to be a consequence of the fundamental assumptions about the way we design AI systems. And um, so I've started a new center. It's called the Center for Human Compatible AI. It's one of those many centers that Francesca mentioned, uh, that are starting to look into these questions because they are really going to be fundamental to the field. Um, and the approach we're taking is that we want to build uh, provably beneficial AI, which means systems that you can prove will be beneficial to the person uh, with whom they're interacting. Um, and the way they do that is actually uh, not by simply taking uh, literally any objective that the human gives them, but by by explicit uncertainty about what the objective might be, um, and then updating that uncertainty with observations uh, of what the human, for example, says they want, which, uh, as in as we know in the case of King Midas, is not what they actually want. Um, and then also their behavior, that every choice a human makes reveals information about their preferences. Uh, and in fact, the entire record of human behavior from the beginning of time uh, in all in all media, uh, whether it's books or movies or television or direct observation, everything provides a lot of information about uh, what it is that humans want. Uh, and of course, we all want different things at different times, and so it's a very complicated problem. But there is a massive amount of information, and this this process of value alignment that Francesco referred to is exactly the process of learning from all of this information. So that's what our center is doing, um, and I'm reasonably optimistic that from a technical point of view, uh, we may be able to create these provably safe uh, design templates for AI systems that um, will end up doing what we want and not making us unhappy. Uh, from a sociological point of view, what I don't know is, is how to ensure that people actually adopt those, uh, those templates. Um, you know, everybody wanted to make sure that nuclear power stations were safe, but we still ended up with Chernobyl. Um, and so uh, that, that's not an issue that can just be brushed under the carpet. Uh, we have to take it very seriously. So those are some of the things I'm thinking about. Hi, my name's Mike Waldrich. Um, you heard about me in the introduction, so I'm not going to give uh, the entire introduction again. Uh, first, let me just say a little bit about what I do, uh, my day job, um, and uh, well, I've been in AI research, it's been my life, it's all I've ever done, 
uh, for 30 years, which is quite a scary prospect. I've been, in, I've been in the area so long that I didn't even learn about it through Stuart Russell's book. I learned about it from the books that went before there. That's how long ago um, it was. Um, well, when I was an undergraduate uh, in my final year, um, there were two areas of computer science that I was really fascinated by, and one was networked and distributed systems, and the other was artificial intelligence. Uh, and when I decided I wanted a career uh, as a researcher, um, it seemed the most natural thing in the world to put those two things together. And so the questions that interested me at the time were, you know, what would networked intelligent systems look like? It seemed such a compelling idea. It seemed very, very natural. And it still does. I'm very happy to say. Um, and that's what I subsequently made my career working in. And that's all I've ever really done. As an undergraduate, I became fascinated by artificial intelligence um, and the uh, technology of the time. If you were working in AI at that time, the technology of the time, the mid 1980s, was expert systems, rule based systems, logic programming with the language prologue, um, all those things that we don't really learn about or teach in AI courses um, anymore. And so in the 30 years since then, I reckon I've seen at least two boom and bust cycles. When I started my research studies, um, expert systems were still quite the thing. Um, and we thought that was the technology of the future. Um, uh, things have changed that since then. And I'll come back and address that point uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a moment. So uh, I had decided that uh, network systems, distributed systems together with artificial intelligence was the future. And so social intelligence then was the question. What do these networked intelligence systems uh, look like? How do you build them? What are the programming languages for them? Uh, what are the key computational questions? What are the key algorithms and so on? So. As I began my PhD studies, the dominant sort of paradigm in which everybody was working was the kind of AI planning paradigm, the idea that we build AI systems that have plans of activity about what they're going to do. And so in the multi-agent setting, the questions were about how can you communicate those plans? How can one agent recognize the plan of another? And so, for example, I, my PhD work looked at things like communication, where you recognize the intentions of other agents and trying to formulate what it meant for multi-agent uh, intentions uh, in, in, in those kinds of environments. And then, as so often happens in science, the paradigm began to change and uh, the, uh, the dominant approach that began to emerge, um, roughly speaking, around about 15 years ago, between 15 and 20 years ago, was based around game theory uh, and the idea of trying to understand uh, multi-agent systems through strategic game theoretic models using game theory as a mathematical language to understand multi-agent interactions which raises all sorts of really interesting uh, research questions which have been driving the field uh, since then but the overarching thread throughout all of my work has been trying to understand social intelligence uh, AI systems in the context of multi-agent systems and how to make decisions in those multi-agent environments and as we heard in the introduction, I mean, I guess what I'm interested in is trying to formalize those questions, make them mathematical and then apply computational techniques to study them. So when I fell in love with AI in uh, the uh, the early 80s, I guess, like so many other people, probably some of our panelists, what really fascinated me were the questions around strong AI, or as we now tend to call it, artificial general intelligence. The idea of conscious machines, machines that have self-awareness uh, and that are fully realized autonomous individuals in the same way that you and I are. But I very rapidly learned, as I think our, probably our other panelists did, it, that that's not where the action is in terms of AI research. That hasn't been a kind of a mainstream AI topic, or it certainly wasn't throughout most of the period of my research. Instead, what AI focused on was a kind of weak AI questions, AI relating to very, very specific tasks. So tasks like machine translation, image recognition, coordination of multiple robots, much more specific problems than the big, interesting uh, questions, the kind of questions that you like to talk about over a beer with your friends. Um, you know, relating to general intelligence and strong AI. Um, but the recent boom in AI, the boom over the last few years, and I guess the reason that we're having this webinar now, 
um, has made me revisit those questions and it's made me ask, you know, where are we actually on that road to sort of strong AI, to artificial general intelligence? Have we made real progress over the last 30 years or have our ideas not evolved at all? And over the last few years, I've had time to think about this question in quite a lot of detail. And I, slightly to my own surprise, came to the conclusion that, yes, I think we do now have better ideas about where we are on that road and what the key questions are. I have to say, I don't think we're very far on that road and I don't see general intelligence, genuinely self-aware machines at any time soon. I think the progress that we've seen over the last decade, the incredible progress we've seen over the last decade has been very much focused around specific tasks specific tasks where you can measure progress easily and when you can optimize to those tasks. That's where the really interesting things have happened. But nevertheless, I think we've now got um, some clearer ideas about what general intelligence might mean, even if we don't have a good idea about how to actually get there. So one question that's been of interest to me then is this question of you know, where are we on this road to general intelligence and what issues does that raise? The second issue that's interested me, partly through my involvement with Your AI, the European Association for AI, IFARMAS, the International Foundation for Multi-Agent Systems, of which I was president for a while, uh, and IJCAI, the International Joint Conference on AI, which I'm currently chairing, is this question of who speaks for AI. Um, and two years ago, I organized a panel at the IJCAI conference, expecting it to be quite a tame uh, and uneventful panel on this question. And really what I was interested in is, you know, the, who is actually speaking in the public arena for AI? Who is the authoritative public voice relating to AI research? What's feasible with AI? What's likely with AI? And so on. Uh, and it turned out this panel was quite phenomenally lively. Um, I learned an awful lot in the 90 minutes or so of this panel. And the question is, is actually quite a complex one about who speaks for AI. And actually, I think is intimately tied up with the question of AI ethics and the future of AI. And I think we really need a proper answer to that question uh, as research scientists. Um, which is very closely tied to this question of ethical uh, issues in AI. And the final thing I want to mention is that, um, uh, like so many others, I became interested, as AI is being taken up more widely, I became interested in the, the, the questions of, of ethics for AI. My particular take on this is, what can AI learn from other disciplines, in particular from medicine, so we were the happy recipients of a, a funding from the Future of Life Institute, indirectly from Elon Musk, um, to investigate these questions with a researcher uh, with a background in medical ethics. Uh, and that's, un uh, that's unveiled some quite interesting lessons that the medical community who've been looking at these issues for over a century that they've learned. Um, so that's my current research, how I got there, and some of the issues relating to ethics in AI that I think are currently interesting. All right. Thanks, everybody, for the interesting round discussion there. That was a really broad overview, and everyone seems to be sort of involved in different ways at a lot of different points in this topic. So that was one of the reasons why uh, we were happy to, to get everyone together for the, uh, the webinar today. So as everyone's been talking, we've gotten, it uh, looks like, over 120 questions submitted so far. Um, and so we're not going to get to all of them, uh, but I would like to go through a few that uh, Rose has been very diligently working in the background here to, to make sure that uh, uh, we have some good ones. And so we're going to keep kind of the same format. We'll go through uh, each of you uh, quickly um, to, to talk about the questions for just a minute or two, and then we'll go around one more time so that maybe uh, you guys can, can, can rebut each other if necessary. Uh, so the first question actually came in before we started the panel today on the, the pre-question uh, announcement. So the first one is, recently AI systems have reached superhuman bellwether performance in a number of domains including Jeopardy, Highway Driving, Go, Vision, and most recently, Computer Poker. Did you expect these outcomes five years prior to their achievement? And what bellwether AI tasks relevant to the labor market might be achieved by 2022? For example, conversational transcription uh, or paid transcription. I think someone mentioned conversational transcription. So uh, we'll start out uh, with uh, Joanna. Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna uh, use this opportunity to both answer the question and uh, address some of the things that some of the other speakers were saying. 
Um, uh, so yes, artificial intelligence is already superhuman and we can go uh, back decades and say we had superhuman calculators. Calculators didn't take over the world. So I am extremely skeptical about these concerns about superintelligence. I don't know if I'm one of the 15 refuted people or whatever Stuart has come up with, but I actually think there, there's a lot of logic. You know, if you read the Bostrom thing, it lays out the logic of the problem of superintelligence. Um, and I'm not denying that. And I and and the unintended goals and consequences are a big problem. But the thing is, human culture already meets all of those criteria. We're the ones who are motivated. We're the ones who build and design the AI. And if we create a commercial system, then we're careful about what that system can and can't do. We're, it's, there's no coffee program ever that is going to have a camera looking at the light switch to figure out that, oh my gosh, the humans are unplugging me. No one will ever build that. So um, yes, I am not at all surprised by the progress of uh, Go, the fact that we've gone superhuman on it. Miles Brundage has done a beautiful job of documenting the fact that this stuff has all been linear and predictable about when we would pass human uh, capabilities. Does it affect labor? Absolutely. We already can transcribe better uh, with humans. I think we're going to have a much more rapid churn of uh, jobs. And I think, well, fortunately, we also have AI to help people retrain. So I don't think making AI, personifying AI and making it into the enemy is the right way to think about this. We have been changing the planet for at least 10,000 years. We have serious problems of sustainability. We have serious problems of, uh, of, of social stability, political stability, and AI is a part of how we are changing the planet. But making AI into the, into the enemy is not the solution. Okay, so <clears throat> so whenever they ask me this question about prediction about the future, I'm you know a bit uh, at ease about that because I'm not sure I can predict the future very well, especially in such a rapidly you know uh, changing and uh, uh, advancing technology such as you know computer science or in, and specifically AI. But of course, I mean, in five years, which is what the question was referring to, I think we, we will see a lot more of, uh, well, for sure, you know, we will see uh, in starting the revolution in transportation because of self-driving cars being better and better and with more advanced and more capabilities for self-driving or even, for, even not necessarily for autonomous self-driving, but for helping uh, humans driver drivers to you know drive better and more safely so that will definitely change a lot we save a lot of lives and will certainly improve our you know quality of life with respect to that i also expect to see uh, uh, some uh, uh, significant advance in natural language you know understanding and interaction between machines and humans um, but uh, uh, and and also maybe some other you know uh, technological advances. But I think that uh, uh, I have problems making you know real you know concrete predictions about what is going to come out in five years because I think that I see some technical challenges which are very basic and needs to be uh, you know addressed before we can have significant advances and new things coming out. And as I said, two of them, for example, have to do with common sense reasoning. You know giving this capability to machines and without that many uh, even natural language uh, you know interaction and understanding is not going to be very general or very deep without the, for the machine to be able to do common sense reasoning um, also uh, I've, another challenge that I mentioned before is, is unsupervised learning and the uh, and so, which means the ability for machines to learn in a way that is more similar to what we do, not by having to give them, you know, uh, a huge amount of examples uh, to tell them what uh, is a cat, what is a dog, and so that the machine, after this huge amount of example, can distinguish between a cat and a dog, but actually to having them to see some examples, but also to have that concept of a cat and a dog in its in his inside and his engine and then to be able to recognize them from you know few examples so 
um, again, so these are challenges that I see that should be addressed. Maybe there are many others after, even after we address them. Uh, and uh, and without them, you know, a very significant step forward in many areas of AI, like, for example, uh, um, uh, like, for example, natural language interaction, I, I don't think they are going to be, uh, they're going to be, to appear. Um, so, yeah, so this is my. Uh, okay, so um, I think it's a great question because I think it really uh, ties into what people should be investing in. Uh, I know a lot of companies are very interested in, in understanding what's coming next and where they should be putting their money. Um, so in addition to self-driving cars, which I think is going to be huge, I mean, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry, so it can't fail to be huge when it happens. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of progress on dextrous manipulation. Uh, you know, at Berkeley, you know, the, the tower falling video is nearly five years old now. Um, and we're looking at, you know, fully autonomous surgery uh, and things like that. So, so with, um, with deep reinforcement learning applied to the dextrous manipulation problem and probably a little bit of progress on the hardware side uh, in terms of better hands and better tactile skin, um, I think we will see capabilities for many manual jobs, uh, agricultural uh, jobs, for example, um, being uh, feasible for machines. Um, another big area um, is natural language processing, which at the moment uh, is very superficial. Um, but I think if it, we are likely to see some progress on um, information extraction that, that's coupling together deep learning kinds of ideas. Uh, and knowledge representation ideas, as Francesca mentioned, uh, through the the medium of generative models. And I think once you have uh, even moderately uh, real natural language understanding, i.e. the conversion of text into some meaningful internal representation that can be reasoned with, then I think uh, enormous numbers of applications become possible, both education, which has been waiting uh, you know, we've been talking about AI tutoring systems for 50 years, but um, it's very hard to tutor a person when neither of you um, speak the same, have any language in common whatsoever, and right up to now, machines simply haven't had any language at all. So it's been very hard for them to be a good teacher to a human. Uh, but if they can start to really understand what the, the pupil is saying and asking and can explain, uh, in non-canned ways, then I think we will see real progress in there, in intelligent personal assistants, and so on. So, um, so these are these are mostly positive developments, although they will have impact on employment. So the question asked whether uh, we expect I expected those outcomes five years prior to their achievement. I think. Uh, Jeopardy, I never really understood the game, to be honest with you. It's a US thing, so I'm not sure how I felt about that. Uh, highway driving, I think, yes, I that problem was solved as of 2005. And since then, it's just been bookkeeping, making the technology slightly more reliable, cheaper, more efficient, and so on. So I think that was pretty well um, flagged up. Uh, computer vision, again, I think there's been steady progress there. There's been really good progress over the last decade, but that community has been steadily chipping away at that problems, exploring different directions. What's interesting about that problem, uh, or what's kind of characteristic about that problem, is the idea that you've got, you know, a kind of a closed system with very, very well-defined criteria for success and failure where there is lots of training data available. And those kinds of characteristics are really the areas where um, I think uh, AI uh, is going to be able to achieve big things over the next few years. Um, Go is an interesting one. I'm not an expert on Go. I mean, I basically understand the rules, but I don't think I could, I, you know, I don't think I could believe, beat a, 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 a 10-year-old Korean child who's, who's played the game, I'm afraid. Um, I did not see that one coming. That one took me by surprise. And uh, I always was led to believe that simply the complexity of the game in terms of search space meant that uh, you know it was going to be a huge challenge so i really didn't ex i didn't see that one coming and i think that was a genuinely dramatic achievement for that time poker to a certain extent i think that was that was sort of predictable people have been working on that there are some challenges but kind of technical ones i think rather than sort of fundamental 
Um, um, I'm, I make it sound like I'm, I'm belittling the achievements of my colleagues, which are really tremendous. Um, but um, I, I would have expected progress there. OK, in the near future, I think we're going to see massive applications in areas like, I mean, the, the standard one that everybody uses, legal secretary. A legal secretary, that's a good job to have. Uh, it's a reasonably well paid middle class job. Um, you know, you, you, where you require an education in order to be able to do that, that kind of job, I think, would be easily automated within the next few years. Um, uh, in medicine, uh, I think we're going to see huge, huge, huge um, uh, uh, take up of AI techniques, not necessarily replacing human practitioners, but augmenting them. And I think we're going to see we're going to see dramatic things happening there. Um, I think Stuart's absolutely right. Um, the we're in the beginning stages of the driverless car revolution and there are 3.5 million truck drivers in the United States and half a million taxi drivers and I don't see any good reasons why they shouldn't all be out of a job because of AI technologies in the next decade or 20 years at the, at the outside and the roads will be safer uh, as a consequence, businesses will run more efficiently and so on. Um, with respect to things like conversational transcription and paid translation, I would just flag up one thing. So uh, this morning I used uh, my, uh, my, my iPhone uh, to, uh, to transcribe an email message and it, the technology works phenomenally well. I remember playing with uh, uh, automated transcription software a decade ago and it wasn't that great. And now my phone does a pretty, pretty good job. But my phone doesn't understand what I'm talking about and the techniques that underpin that software which is which is genuinely impressive software, but the techniques that underpin it don't make any attempt to actually understand. So the actual example this morning, and this is an entirely re entirely genuine one, where I said to my phone, um, "Please, can you send over the templates for the job description, and I'll complete them." Uh, almost almost exactly what I said. And what happened was it transcribed it as ten plates. Now, a human transcriber would never have made that mistake because it doesn't make any sense. Ten plates in that context doesn't make any sense. You have to have some knowledge of what I'm trying to communicate, which a human transcriber would. Um, as yet, that knowledge is missing from automated translation and from transcription software. And I think that is a big challenge for those kinds of technologies at the moment. Okay, I'm going to take up the uh, loop back and, and comment very quickly on a few things. The um, the go the go uh, thing is it's an interesting point because what's what's going on there is this inconceivably huge space of possible moves, and what AI, what what DeepMind were able to do with AI was both capture what humans the little bit of space that humans are already searched and then elaborate a little bit beyond that. And this is this is understanding that understanding that there's this huge space, and the reason that AI is moving so fast is we're capturing what humans have already figured out. Um, I think also gets at helping us understand about exactly sort of that. I think the whole general intelligence thing is going going down a wrong strategy there. But coming back to what Stuart was saying about the tutoring and what Mike just said about um, Uber. Um, uh, sorry, he wasn't talking about Uber. He said taxi drivers will be replaced. Uber thinks that they're actually going to have more Uber drivers because people won't bother owning uh, cars, and then some proportion of society will want a human to help them in and out of the car. This is what's happened with uh, banks and ATMs. There are fewer tellers per branch of a bank, but there's actually more branches because they're cheaper. So it may be that we're going to find all of these things like the tutoring, the more informed translation, whatever. This is about employment, and it's about um, policies about how much we pay humans. Um, and, and what, what kind of <clears throat> uh, push that we make economically towards having humans so that our services are good. But basically, uh, I do see AI as enhancing human capabilities. And one other final very quick thing, I think bigger than dexterity is cybersecurity. I think we haven't got our heads around how um, having AI in the homes is going to be challenged by the issues of whether that, that can get hacked. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, we're quickly coming up on time, so we're going to move on to another question. Uh, this is another question that, um, that I wrote, so it's why you organize a panelist to ask your own question. Uh, but it does summarize a number of, it's, it covers a number of the questions that people have been asking as well. So, uh, and, and many of you talked about this at the, at the top. So many of the conversations around AI and ethics 
uh, seem to center around technological changes or adjustments uh, to solve technological problems. Um, and that seems, that's, that's kind of what we do as academics and, and practitioners or researchers. Uh, but what sort of, and Michael touched on this as well, what responsibility do you think that we have um, to engage other modalities uh, in, to deal with this, to deal with these, these topics, right, to, to, to touch on law or politics and education um, in order to abate some of the concerns that, that, are, that are here? And many of you are involved in, in efforts to this, to this effect, so I'd like to hear sort of specific, uh, if you have any specific recommendations um, at, that you're currently thinking about. Um, we'll go. Uh, we'll go back to Joanna here to start off. All right, I'll be very short since I accidentally took the only second <laughs> shot. Um, it's not just about abating; it is absolutely working with other people. Doesn't just give you know average citizens confidence. Those guys are super useful. I, I have been really enjoying engaging with uh, lawmakers, with lawyers with uh, ethicists, people from humanities, um, especially law professors. I guess it's because law is kind of like programming, so it's kind of geeky and easy to get together. But yeah, there, we're affecting society and we have to talk to society and, and we have to talk to experts in understanding how society really works and how the economy really works. Oh yeah, I've been talking to economists too, they're brilliant. So yeah, absolutely. So yes, so as I said before, I think really this multidisciplinary discussion and working together is essential in order to address the concerns and solve the problems that there are in deploying AI system to the real world. Uh, for, in, for example, in the partnership of AI, we envision a lot of specific working groups uh, in various sectors of, uh, you know, of uh, applications like, uh, for example, in healthcare, uh, manufacturing, uh, transportation, uh, robotics in general, uh, and uh, engaging with all the people that build those systems, all the people that deploy those systems, and all the people that use those systems as well, as well as policy makers that may be, we may be in the position to possibly regulate those systems as well. So I think that all these stakeholders are needed in order to, you know, really address the, the, the issues in the best way. And I think a very important thing that we can do as AI people uh, in, uh, you know, outreaching to these other communities is really educating them. Because I think that one of the things that I saw by talking to, uh, you know, policymakers or business people is that uh, sometimes they are not really aware of what AI really is and where the state of the art really is at this point. What are the limitations that AI still has and what are the challenges that are still ahead of us in order to build the capabilities that we want to build, like for self-driving cars or for uh, natural language processing and so on. And so this is very important, you know, to give them really the right understanding of AI in order to build the, you know, the, the a meaningful conversation, a meaningful discussion, a meaningful concrete action point uh, based on really what AI really is. Uh, I found that many think that AI, for example, is just um, deep learning. Uh, which instead is a small part of AI and it's very, very powerful. It gave AI a lot of uh, capabilities, perception capabilities, so that now AI can really be used in the real world, while before, without this perception capability, it could only be used in a very co controlled environment. And that's very, very important for making AI being usable and deployable in the real world. But there are many other things that one needs to do and understand, like scheduling activities, planning, and, uh, you know, and understanding how to represent the knowledge about the world and so on. So many other things combined with learning and specifically deep learning. So there are, you know, some misconceptions about AI that need to be resolved. So we have, uh, you know, I think the obligation to, besides many other things, to educate all these different stakeholders in the discussion about AI and the current state. Um, so I think, um, I've learned that there's an enormous amount I don't know. Uh, and the biggest question, so let's assume that we, we succeed in, in creating sort of unlimited amounts of AI and we succeed in avoiding the pitfalls of value misalignment and so on. Um, then potentially in the long run, AI 
would allow us as humans to finally have a choice about what we want. Instead of being mired in conflict uh, and dealing with poverty and disease uh, and resource limitations and so on, we might actually have a choice about how to live. Um, and that raises this question of what is an ideal society, and that's not something that AI people can or should be answering, but we need a lot of help from from philosophers, from science fiction writers, you know, just thinking about possible futures uh, and trying to understand how to even make a choice uh, along those lines. And in that regard, I would recommend that everyone who hasn't read it should read uh, a story by E.M. Forster from 1909 called The Machine Stops, which, which talks about one uh, of course, it's a dystopian future, but it, a, a future where machines are doing everything for humans um, and where, in fact, everyone is on the Internet uh, giving MOOC lectures or listening to MOOC lectures, uh, having video conference chats on their iPads uh, and getting obese because they're sitting around on the screen all the time. Um, and I think it really raises questions about the value of human autonomy and the extent to which AI should really recede into the background, that we shouldn't think of AI as, as taking over uh, all aspects of life, um, but it should provide a scaffolding that enables us to, to do as much uh, as possible by ourselves, uh, because I think there's intrinsic value uh, in human autonomy. So these are, these are questions that um, I think we really need to do a lot of cultural work around. It's, they're, they're not technical questions that we can prove theorems about. Uh, but we need uh, we need everyone to to understand the possible futures and to help uh, help in choosing what they're going to be. So, um, what role do we as academics and practitioners have in engaging others, such as uh, uh, law, politics, education, to abate some of the concerns around ethics and AI? So, I spoke about a panel I organised uh, in 2015, and how surprised I was that. Stuff that I thought was blindingly obvious, um, for example, relating to lethal autonomous weapons and uh, that, that there ought to be a debate over those uh, was not at all obvious to other panelists. And the debate ended up being quite a fierce debate. This was quite a big educational experience to me. I mean, I guess I was just I was just sort of a hopelessly naive sort of liberal in my own little bubble, assuming that everybody else was like me. And I discovered that that wasn't the case. So since then, I, I, you know, I've moderated my views somewhat. I mean, I strongly believe as a scientist, our, it is part of our job to inform public opinion, to be a responsible voice, informing uh, public opinion and being a reliable spokesperson on, on matters relating to the research that we do. I mean, I think what we right now, the most pressing need is to educate the politicians, to educate the lawmakers, to educate the military, the research funders, and so on about what is realistic and what the uh, what isn't realistic about AI, uh, and perhaps more importantly, you know, what are the the real challenges that society will face as opposed to the perceived challenges. So, you know, I'm going out on a limb, but I don't believe the robot takeover is imminent, right? I don't think that's what's frightening. Uh, about AI, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that we should worry about. And unemployment and inequality, these things are real. Um, they are, you know, I, I, I said there are three and a half million truck drivers in the United States, half a million taxi drivers. What happens if they all lose their job? How do they make their livelihoods? You know, where what happens to the economy? What does the economy look like? What does an economy look like if, you know, in the traditional model of the economy, there was there was capital, the money and labor, the means of production and the economy worked by putting those two things together. But if you just need capital and you don't need the means of production anymore because the means of the production is AI, what does the economy look like? How is it going to work? Um, and it's not at all obvious to me. I mean, some of my colleagues talk about things like universal income and, uh, you know, we're all going to leave, lead lives of leisure reading Plato in the sunshine because AI will be doing all our work for us. It's not obvious to me that that's how the economy is going to pan out. Um, so I think our role is to educate the politicians, the lawmakers, lobby groups, all those people to make sure that they understand what is uh, realistic and what isn't realistic about AI, what things they should be worried about as opposed to what things they shouldn't be worried about. And I say things like inequality, privacy, uh, those things are certainly things that we certainly should be worried about. 
All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. That was uh, really, <laughs> I had a really good time. Uh, we're, we're running a bit short on time. Um, so I think next time we're going to have to try to uh, leave more time for Q&A. Um, so I want to uh, thank all of our, our panelists, Joanna, uh, Francesca, Stuart, uh, and, and Michael, again, for engaging in the town hall and uh, their insightful answers to our, to our two questions, but also more generally for taking the time to speak with us about uh, the different things that they're working on and, and sort of what they're excited about right now. I need to echo Stuart in that The Machine Stops is a great story that we, I used it when teaching artificial intelligence at Kentucky. Uh, it's a great, great story. Should, oh, everybody should read it. Um, so as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be, on, will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org slash webinar. You can find announcements on upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and at acm.org. We're going to take, we got uh, over uh, 150 questions um, come in while we were speaking. Uh, we're going to take some of those uh, and, and try to get the ones that are sort of uh, most, uh, the, the sort of the center of the clusters uh, and, and ask the, the panel to maybe provide us with a short response to those. And we'll uh, post that on the SIG AI uh, blog where some of you who had really great questions in the comments, and we're sorry that we couldn't get to them all, uh, can come and, and maybe uh, see what, what some of the, the panel's thoughts on those questions were. And uh, as, a, as a reminder, the, the ACM SIG AI Student Essay Contest is also open and another way for, for everyone to participate, uh, participate in this conversation. So again, that's also uh, at the ACM SIG AI blog, which is at sigai.acm.org slash AI Matters slash blog. So we invite everybody to uh, come check that out uh, to continue the discussion. As a final thing, um, there will be a quick survey that comes up on everyone's screen where you can suggest future topics or speakers, um, and which you'll, again, which will pop up on your screen here in just a moment. Uh, you can click on the survey icon in the right sidebar under resources if you don't see it on your screen. Um, and that helps us provide better webinars and, and things in the future. So on behalf of uh, the ACM, uh, the panel, uh, Rosemary, uh, myself, Nick Mate, uh, and, and everyone that, that sort of logged in, there's quite a few of you that joined us today, uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, I hope you'll join us again in the future.